The Joyous Story of Toto by Laura E. Richards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 8 The Story of the Tale of the Baron's War Horse. Is this one of your own stories that you're going to tell us, Pigeon Pretty? inquired the squirrel when they were next assembled around the cottage door. No, replied the wood pigeon. This is a story I heard a short time ago. I was flying home after paying a visit to some cousins of mine who live in a village some miles away. As I passed by a pretty white cottage, something like this, I noticed that there were crumbs scattered on one of the window sills. Here lives someone who is fond of birds, said I to myself, and as I was rather hungry, I stopped to pick up some of the crumbs. The window was open, and looking in, I saw a pretty and neatly furnished room. Near the window was a bed, in which lay a boy of about Toto's age. He was evidently ill, for he had a bandage tied round his head, and he looked pale and thin. Beside the bed sat a little girl, apparently a year or two older, a sweet, pretty girl, as one would wish to see. She was reading aloud to her brother, I suppose he was her brother, from a large red book. Neither of the children noticed me, so I sat on the window sill for some time, and heard the whole of this story, which you shall now hear in your turn. It is called The Story of the Tale of the Baron's War Horse. Many years ago there lived a baron, famous in peace and war, but chiefly in the latter. War was his great delight, fighting his natural occupation, and he was never so much in his element as when leading his valiant troops to battle, mounted on his noble iron-gray charger. Ah, what a charger that was! Stately and strong, swift and sure, fiery and bold, yet ready to obey his master's lightest touch or softest word. Briefly, a horse in ten thousand. Right proud the baron was of his gallant steed, and right well did they love each other, horse and master. The vassals of the baron knew no greater pleasure than to see their lord ride by mounted on grey barreled. It filled their souls with joy, and caused them to throw up their caps and shout, Hi! in a hilarious manner. As for the lovely Ermengarde, the baron's young and beautiful wife, she would far rather have gone without her dinner than have missed the sight. Whenever Grey Barold was brought to the door, she hastened out, and overwhelmed him with caresses and words of endearment, preferring, meanwhile, the toothsome sugar and the crisp and sprightly apple, neither of which the engaging animal disdained to accept. In truth, it was a goodly sight to see the golden locks of the lady, for was she not known in all the country as Ermengarde of the Fair Tresses? mingling with the wavy silver of the charger's mane, as he bent his head lovingly over his fair young mistress. A goodly sight, and one which often sent the bold baron rejoicing on his way, with a tender smile on his otherwise slightly ferocious countenance. It chanced one day that a great tournament was about to take place in the neighborhood. All the knights in the country round, and many bold champions from a greater distance, were to show their prowess in riding at the ring, and in friendly combat with each other. Among the gallant knights, who so ready for the tournament as our bold baron? He fairly pranced for the fray, for there had been no war for two months, and he was very weary of the long, peaceful days. He had been practicing for a week past, riding at any number of rings of different sizes, and tilting with his squire whom he had run through the body several times, thereby seriously impairing that worthy's digestive powers. And now the eventful morning was come. The vassals were assembled in the courtyard of the castle, a goodly array, to see their master depart in pomp and pride. Grey Barold was brought round to the door, magnificently caparisoned, his bridle and housings glittering with precious stones. The gallant steed pawed the ground and tossed his head proudly, as impatient of delay as his master. From a balcony above leaned the lovely Ermengarde, her golden tresses crowned with a nightcap of rare and curious design, for the baron was making an early start, 
and his fair lady had not yet completed her toilet. Among the vociferous cheers of his vassals, the baron descended the steps, armed cap a pie, his good sword by his side, and his mace, battle-axe, cutlass, and shillelagh displayed about his stately person in a very imposing manner. He could scarcely walk, it is true, so many and so weighty were his accoutrements, but then, as he himself aptly observed, he did not want to walk. He got into the saddle with some difficulty, owing to the tendency of his battle-axe to get between his legs, but once there the warrior was at home. An attendant handed him his lance, with its glittering pennon. Grey barreled pranced and curvetted, making nothing of the enormous weight on his back. The Lady Ermengarde waved her broidered kerchief, and with a parting glance at his lovely bride, the Baron rode slowly out of the courtyard. But alas, he was not destined to ride far. Alas for the proud Baron! Alas and alack for the gallant steed! He had scarcely ridden a hundred paces when he heard a fearful growl behind him, which caused him to turn quickly in his saddle. What was his horror to see a huge bear spring out of the woods and come rushing at him? For one moment the baron was paralyzed. The next he wheeled his horse around and, couching his lance, prepared to meet his savage assailant. But Grey Barold had not bargained for this. Many a fair fight had he seen in battlefield and in tourney. Many a time he had faced danger as boldly as his rider, and had borne the brunt of many a fierce attack but those fights were with men and horses he knew what they were and how they should be met but this was something very different this great creature that came rushing along with its head down and its mouth open was something beryl did not know moreover it was something he did not like stand there and be rushed at by a thing that was neither horse nor man not if he knew it and just when the bear was close upon him Grey Barold, with a squeal of mingled terror and anger, wheeled short round. The bear made a spring, and caught the charger by the tail. The terrified animal bounded forward. The baron made a downward stroke with his battle-axe that would have felled an ox, and Master Bruin—no offence to you, my dear fellow, it's the name of all your family, you know—rolled over and over in the dust. But alas, and alas! He took the tail with him. That noble tail, the pride of the stable-yard, the glory of the grooms, lay in the road, a glittering mass of silver. And it was a tailless steed that now galloped frantically back to the castle court, from which only a few minutes ago he had so proudly emerged. The baron was mad with fury. Pity for his gallant horse, rage and mortification at the ridiculous plight he was in, anxiety lest he should be late for the tournament all combined to make him for a time beside himself he rushed up and down the courtyard whirling his battle-axe round his head and uttering the most fearful imprecations finally however yielding to the tears and entreaties of his retainers he calmed his noble frenzy and set himself to think what was best to be done give up the tournament perish the thought Ride another horse than Barold, never while he lives. Ride him tailless and unadorned, shades of my ancestors forbid. Thus cried the baron at every new suggestion of his sympathizing retainers. At last, the head groom had an idea. Let us fasten on another tail, he said, and please your worship. Ha! cried the baron, starting at the notion. Tis well. Ho, oh, there, Hodge, Barnaby, Perkin. Cut me the tails from the three cart-horses, and tie them together, and be quick about it, ye knaves. The three grooms flew to execute their master's mandate, and returned in a few minutes bearing a magnificent tail, whose varied hues of black, sorrel, and white showed it to be the spoil of Dobbin, Smiler, and Bumps, the three stout Flemish cart-horses. By my halidome, a motley tail! exclaimed the baron, but it boots not, so it be a tail. Fasten it on with all speed, for time presses. Ha! What is this? Well might the baron start and exclaim. The moment the three grooms touched the flanks of Grey Barold, before they had time to lay hands on the stump of his tail, 
they found themselves flying through the air and tumbling in a very uncomfortable sort of way against the wall of the courtyard. Mary, that was a brave kick, and when he had given it, the charger looked around after the unhappy grooms and tossed his stately head and snorted, evidently meaning to say, "'Don't you want to try it again?' But the poor grooms did not want to try it again. They picked themselves up, rubbed their poor shins and their poor heads, and proceeded to hobble off on their poor feet as fast as they could. But they did not hobble far, for the voice of the baron was heard in angry expostulation. "'How now, varlets?' cried that nobleman. "'Do you slink away like beaten hounds, because, forsooth, the good beast shakes off a fly, or lashes out his heels in playful sport? Shame on ye, coward hinds! Back, I command ye, and tie me on that tail. Obey, sirs, or else, hum, uh, hum. And the baron waved his battle-axe, and looked as if he had swallowed the meat-chopper, and the gridiron, and the blunderbuss, all at one mouthful. Hodge, Barnaby, and Perkin were in a bad way, assuredly. On the one hand was the charger, snorting defiance, with his heels all ready for the next kick, should they presume to touch him. On the other was the furious baron, also snorting, with his battle-axe all ready for the next whack, should they presume not to touch him. Here were two sharp horns to a dilemma. Cautiously, the poor knaves crept up once more behind Grey Barreled. "'Vault thou upon his back, Perkin,' whispered Barnaby. "'Perchance from there, whizz-whack thud!' This time Beryl did not wait for them to touch him. The sound of their voices was enough. There they all lay in a heap against the wall, moaning sore and cursing the day they were born. But now the Baron's humor changed. "'Beshrew me!' he cried. "'Tis a gallant steed. He will not brook at such a moment the touch of hireling hands. Tis well. Give me the tale, my masters, and ye shall see.' Alas, they did see. They saw their baron rolling over and over on the ground. They saw their baron roll. They heard their baron rave. They turned and fled for their lives. At this moment the portal swung open, and the Lady Ermengarde appeared. She had seen all from an upper window, and she now hastened to raise her fallen lord, who sat spluttering and cursing on the ground, unable to rise, owing to the weight of all his armor. "'Oh, blame not the steed!' cried the lovely lady. "'Chide not the gallant beast, good my lord. "'Twas not the touch, twas the tail he could not brook. "'Tie the rustic tail of a plebeian cart-horse on grey barreled. "'Oh, fie, my lord, it may not be. "'I will provide a tail for your charger.' "'You?' exclaimed the baron. "'What mean you, lady?' "'The lady Ermengarde replied by drawing from the embroidered pouch "'which hung from her jewelled girdle a pair of shears. "'Snip, snip, snip, snap and before her astonished lord could interfere, the golden tresses, the pride of the whole countryside, were severed from her head. Deftly she tied the shining curls together. Lightly she stepped to where Grey Barreled stood. She stroked his noble head. She spoke to him. She showed him the tresses, and told him what she had done. Then, with her own hands, she tied them on to the stump of his tail with her embroidered girdle and grey barrel moved not foreleg nor hind but stood like a steed of granite till it was done the retainers were dissolved in tears the baron sobbed aloud as he climbed with the assistance of seven hostlers into the saddle but the heroic lady smiled and bade them be of good cheer she could get a black wig she said she had always thought she would look better as a brunette and to make a long story short said the wood-pigeon. She did get a black wig, and looked like a beauty in it. And the baron went to the tournament and won all the prizes. And Grey Barreled lived to be sixty years old, and wore the golden tail to the end of his days. And that's all. End of chapter 8